We're back. This is Dr. Soren, and I've got as my guest today Dr. Ramon Issa. Uh, we're airing this on radio on AM 1400 KSPT, AM 1450 KBFI. We're also putting it on my YouTube channel and uh, my website, drsorin.com, D-R-S-O-R-I-N.com. And uh, just trying to spread the message. This is really my passion. Uh, I do what I do in pain management because that's what I've been trained to do, and I enjoy it. I feel like you know, help give people <clears throat> a new opportunity to live with no pain or at least with less pain and have that quality of life. But to me, the real trick is if we can get people eating better, exercising, you know, making better choices, then I feel like I've helped them for their whole lifetime rather than if we just do an injection, you know, work with some medications, physical therapy, you know, we've helped them uh, for a shorter time. But I'm trying, I'm looking at the big picture long term. So, Dr. Isa uh, and Isa Health Solutions, just go ahead, give a plug for your uh, website. So, I, like you said, Soren, uh, what, what I'm talking about and what I'm passionate about uh, is helped me tremendously and it gave me hope, uh, most importantly, and it can help other people and it has helped other people. And so what we're doing is important and it's powerful. And so if you need help or some pointers or some inspiration, I do operate a Facebook page, Isa Health Solutions. And I'm on Twitter causing trouble as well, and Dr. Ramon Issa on Twitter. And so you can look there or Facebook. And I, 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 whenever I have like ideas and like ways to present things based on what we're talking about, the principles of health and preventing these conditions and reversing them, um, I'll just write a little nice little paragraph or a little article on how I kind of look at things. And hopefully each time, and it's presented a different way, it may help someone uh, that resonates with them, uh, yeah. you know, that way. So, And I've had patients look you up and they can actually talk to you yep. on uh, ESA Health yep. Solutions. They can connect with you. <clears throat> so, so far we've kind of talked about the problem, but let's go into the solution real quick. Let's finish up your story of how you made the change. So you noticed you're overweight, had high blood pressure, uh, you know, joint aches, um, sleep apnea, weren't, wasn't, weren't feeling rested. What did you do? So I finally got so frustrated uh, that I was willing to do whatever it took. So that's what happened. So my spirit changed. And all of a sudden I had the spirit of nothing's going to stop me. I'm willing to do anything. I'm tired of living this way and I, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I found out that I was, uh, that I, because of how sick I was, how obese I was, um, that I could have qualified for gastric bypass surgery. And so that was a major like, you know, that number of 300 and something, I knew that wasn't right. Well, I knew because I took care of patients that qualify for gastric bypass. And I was like, no, right? So that kind of pierces through denial. You can't fake being qualified for gastric bypass surgery. And once I knew, because that's very kind of a high risk thing. You don't want to take it lightly. You need to be able to try everything else first. And they make you do a diet and fail other things before you go to gastric bypass um, because it's a big deal and there's risks involved and then you can die from the surgery and have complications. And I said, I'm in that category? Well, I said, well, that means I can do whatever the heck I want because that's pretty risky. So if I'm okay that a doctor could take the risk of putting me under the knife for gastric bypass, that's a high risk person. You can now take whatever a lot of more risk than somebody who just has five pounds to lose or 10 pounds to lose, you know, because that, that's not as lethal as being morbidly obese and having these things. So my brain was just opened up after that. And so I, I was listening to an interview talking about using fat for fuel, the body using fat for fuel. And I was thinking, I was like, uh, and I'm, you know, I, I'd prayed earlier. I'm like, I need God, you know, I want to lose weight. I need to reverse my obesity. I don't know what's going on, what I'm doing. I can't stop eating. I'm morbidly obese. I feel like crap. Yeah, and you said you were eating all the time. Oh, I was eating and all the time. And you were hungry all the time. I was time. hungry. And I was like, is there a way that the body can use its own fat for fuel? You know, because... Um, the interview was about fat for fuel, eating good, healthy fats. And I was like, God, do you want me to eat more health, more fats so that I can lose weight? And I'm like, no. God's like, hey, listen, silly. I want you to use your fat for fuel, not eat fat for fuel, your fat. And I was like, no, that's ridiculous. And I was like, well, let's pretend that that's true. Let's pretend the body can use its own fat for fuel. How, how would that be? So because I went to medical school, actually it was paying attention on this one thing. And I remembered for some reason, I know now, um, I remembered that the body can use fat as a primary fuel if it runs out of glycogen, which is carbohydrate, which is glucose in, in the body. If it runs out of that, now it can switch over to burning fat for fuel. 
But at the time, I thought it was dangerous because it was ketosis and you're going to get sick and die like diabetic would. And I said, well, I don't know. I didn't know anything about intermittent fasting or low-carb diets or anything like that at the time. Um, I just knew that if I run out of glycogen and carbohydrates, my body will use its own fat for energy. I just remember that. And so I was like, well, guess what? Hmm. So until I know where my carbohydrates are coming from or what I'm doing that's making me sick or keeping me sick, I'm not going to eat anything. Nothing will go into my mouth except for water until I know that I'm using my fat for fuel. So you fasted. So I, I, I didn't know that's what it was you called. You stopped eating. I stopped eating and it hurt. And it, I, I was starving. Now you call it fasting. It's so nice. and it's You called it hangry, I think. Oh, I, was, oh, I wanted to eat. I was walking around and I was still working and doing all this stuff. But, and I was so, the first 24 hours was unbelievable because I used to eat every two or three hours. People would ask, oh, how many times a day do you eat? And I was like, once? And they're like, really? Because I'm like 300 pounds. I'm like, all day. <laughs> I would just eat from the moment I got up, even if I wasn't hungry, till the moment I went to bed. Because, quote, unquote, I was trained. If you don't eat and you skip a meal, your metabolism would drop. Well, oh, doggone it. I don't want my metabolism dropping. That's the last. Well eat all the time. That's the last thing this guy wants is his metabolism dropping. So to lose weight, you need to eat more often. Right? And so, I mean, that's the thoughts that I was, that's what I was trained. You skip a meal, you, your metabolism drops, you don't lose weight. So I fasted, but I didn't eat. It took, my, took me four days to only have water. I did not have any food for four days until I was convinced that my body was burning fat for fuel. And so, like, like you said, the first few, you know, few days, I was, it was ravenously hungry. I was hangry. I was irritable. I wanted to eat paper and plastic. I was looking at everything looked like food. I was, I, I just, I was like, what, happened? what would happen if I ate paper? <laughs> what would happen if I ate some of that whatever material that's over there? I mean, I, was, I didn't know what to do because I just knew something I was doing. I wasn't born this way. Something I'm doing is making me sick or keeping me sick, and I don't know what it is. And until I do, and I know I'm burning fat, and each day got a little bit less painful, a little bit less better. I wasn't having salt and minerals and things that you're supposed to have when you're not eating called fasting to make it nice and friendly and so it's not so painful. And then finally, on the third day, I wasn't feeling as terrible. It wasn't good, mind you. I was still not feeling good, but I wasn't feeling as crummy. And then, but I still had no energy. I just felt terrible. And my wife, every day I'd wake up and we'd, I'd see her. She'd be like, are you going to eat today? I was like, no, not today. She goes, when? I'm like, I don't know. And then the next day, how are you going to eat today? No, I don't know. And she's like, you're going to die. And I'm like, whatever. Okay. Okay. I qualify for gastric bypass surgery. I am going to die because I'm morbidly obese. And if I don't do something, I'm going to die. So I got to do something. And uh, then on the fourth day, I woke up and I'm getting ready for work. And all of a sudden, I'm, I find myself, I was whistling. And I was kind of had a little skip in my step. And I had some, and I thinking in my head while I'm getting ready and I'm leaving the house to go to work, my suit, whatever. I was thinking, that's so funny. I've got energy today, and I, it's like I haven't eaten anything in four days. Where would that energy come from? Literally said that in my head, and I just stopped, and the light bulb went off. And I said, I am now, I've reached the point in my textbook where it said, when you run out of glycogen or carbohydrates, your body will burn fat. So I said, I guarantee you, I feel awesome. I've got new energy I didn't have. I haven't eaten in four days. You see, if I would have been eating stuff, I would have said, oh, the stuff I'm eating is fixing me or giving me energy. But I wasn't, so I hadn't. There was no confusion where my energy was, my fuel was coming from. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't die four days later and I felt good and had energy. I was burning fat. So then I was like, well, now it's time to eat, you see. But then I was like, well, if I eat, it's going to stop, tell my body, stop burning fat because here's the food. I said, well, not unless I don't eat the glycogen and refill the glycogen, the carb stores again. It'll stay burning my fat. That was my theory. And I tested it and I lost 90 pounds in 100 days. Oops. 90 pounds, 100 days. My blood pressure went from 175 over 100 down to 120 over 70. My heartburn went away. My snoring went away. My sleepiness went away. My joints stopped hurting. Uh, I mean, it sounds like I was like visiting leprechauns and you know unicorns and pots of gold and rainbows <laughs> and stuff. And I was blown away because I, four days before, I was telling people, you're never going to get better. You can't reverse this. You're always going to have obesity and heartburn and sleep apnea and blood pressure issues. You're on medicine for the rest of your life. And then now I was having my eyes open. And on that fourth day, mm -hmm. when I felt awesome and I was not eating anything and my burning fat for fuel, and I, my ravenous cravings, I stopped wanting to eat paper and plastic and food. I had 100% control over my hunger. It was gone. I knew now that my body's burning its fat for fuel, and my hunger and cravings aren't out of control, driving me to do things that I shouldn't, that I had the control to implement whatever I wanted to do from the fourth day, even though I was still 300 and whatever pounds, I knew 
I was going to be successful because I can now control what went in my mouth and I couldn't four days before. Boom. Love it. Friggin' awesome. <laughs> incredible testimony, if you will. Uh, incredible story. And and I watched you go through that because right. I'd met you in Loma Linda. That's right. Uh, you did. You saw me uh, par partly through that process. Big Ramon. Because you've right. always been a big guy. We used to play volleyball together 25 yep. years ago. Uh, you've always been tall. Mm -hmm. But then I hadn't seen you in about 20 years, and you'd really put on some weight. And the next time I see you drop weight, and then the time after that you drop more weight. I mean, it was just an amazing transformation. So <clears throat> let's, let's jump into a little bit of physiology. Because uh, mm, I think this I is it. super important for people to understand. Because I think people understand how a car works. This is an analogy I used. Um, mm -hmm. When you drive a car, you say your car holds 20 gallons, you put 20 gallons in, you go drive around, but you don't stop at every gas station and try to shove another 20 gallons in, drive another hour, put another 20 gallons in, drive, you just, every gas station you see, right? But that's what we do as people. Everywhere you see food, we tend to eat it and eat it and eat it. And so I think people can understand that when you eat, your insulin goes up and your body stores that fuel. And then you're supposed to use that fuel over time, just like your car. You fill it up, and then you've got enough fuel for three, four, five hundred miles, right? Exactly. So you, you fill it up, and then you empty it. And then you fill it up, and you empty it. But what we do is you fill it up, and you empty it a quarter way, halfway. You fill it up some more. Empty it out a little, right? So, so let's talk a little bit about how the body works. So that's what, I, what you just described. Mm -hmm. That's what the old Ramon that was obese and insulin resistant, high fat, high insulin levels, a hormone that stores energy. That's what I would do. I didn't know my liver or my, like, was it like basically in your scenario, you continue with your analogy, my liver was a fuel tank or a gas tank. Um, and the body's primary source of fuel to turn into energy is glucose. That's the currency the body uses. That's carbohydrate energy. You know, that's glucose energy. And it, the liver is constantly monitoring the glucose levels in the blood. That's your fuel. That's the gas tank. So your gas tank is liver, you know, fuel. And your body's checking that glucose level. It wants it between, uh, you know, according to the textbooks and my experience, 70 and 100, you know, on the, on the fuel. And you can only hold about a teaspoon of, yeah. of fuel in the blood or grams of carbohydrate in the blood. And if it gets low, your body has a mechanism in place to raise it. If it gets too high, over 100, it'll do something like insulin and put it down. So it has a homeostasis. It wants to maintain a stable. Your body likes stable levels of glucose. It's essential, you need it, it's the operating system, it's the fuel, okay? And if the level goes high, it has something, if it goes too low, it has something. And I was going around with a full gas tank, quote unquote, and constantly, whether it was empty or full, filling it up, filling it up, because I didn't know where the fuel was coming from and what my food was and my drink was. Is it fuel, nutrition, energy? What's the problem here? Yeah, and so if your body, let's just talk about the physiology. <coughs> if your body, has too much fuel. So like when you eat, you eat more calories than you need right that, you know, for the next five, 10 minutes. So what does your body do with that fuel? First, the, the, the sugar gets absorbed in your bloodstream, goes to your liver, it stores as much as it can, it takes that sugar, the carbs, and it turns them into glycogen that's stored, uh, short-term storage in your liver. And then what happens with the extra glycogen? Well, if you accidentally, like old Ramon used to do, and eat more sugar or carbohydrate than I needed, especially fructose part of sugar, um, it will. if your liver is full of glycogen and has no more place to store, safely store this fuel energy of, of carbohydrate, it'll turn it into fat in your liver because your body is not stupid. It wasn't designed poorly by God, or if you're not a Christian by nature, it's not wasteful. This fuel energy will save your life, will sustain you. I always tell patients, you know, in the ER, the last thing to drop before you die is your blood sugar. Your blood sugar is going to stay at that level no matter what. You'll stop everything, breathing, moving, thinking, whatever, but that blood sugar, the very last thing to go is the blood sugar. It sustains your life. If you give more fuel than you need, okay, like you said, when you eat, you eat more than you need at that given time. Your muscles will use it, your brain, your kidneys, your whatever, okay, that it uses what it can, it stores what it doesn't as glycogen in the liver, and any more carbohydrate fuel or sugar fuel gets stored as fat, which is triglycerides, fatty liver. You see the connection here? Yeah. Yeah, so. Right. So and that's just <laughs> energy, it's fuel, it's energy, it's not bad, carbs are not bad, they're not good. Your body it, runs on carbs. That's what it is. Yeah. That's what so, they do. Your short-term storage, your body takes, runs off of sugar, basically, carbohydrates, glucose. So whatever your body has in excess, 
Because otherwise, if you had too much, it would make you very sick. That's right. And we can talk about that. But having too high a sugar, so then your body turns that sugar, says, oh, no, I got too much sugar, turns it into fat. Yes. And that's your long-term storage. Yes. Yeah. And so if you want to maintain your weight, that's okay. It turns that sugar into fat. Then you need to take a break from eating. And then you run that process in reverse where it takes that fat and turns it into back into energy that your body can use. Exactly. So let's talk about that reversing that process. That process. Yeah. So that's right. So there, this brings up a good point because when you're t- when I'm talking to somebody or you're talking to a patient, you have to know what state their body is in, and it's changing. It fluxes. Somebody that is healthy, that's lean, that has no excess fat in their liver or excess fat in their body or high insulin or high hormone levels. The insulin, remember, that stores energy. So when you eat, it's energy, you know, carbohydrate, fat, whatever. Insulin goes up, it stores it and tucks it away for later. If somebody is obese or has fatty liver or has diabetes or metabolic syndrome, you have more liver fat than you need. You have higher insulin storage level than you need. It doesn't just go up with your meal. It goes up with your meal, the insulin is stores. But if you're any one of those things I just described and you're not healthy or you're overweight, it never drops back down to a level where your body cannot access fat energy very well. You so see. insulin, like you mentioned, your body it's wants very homeostasis. Important. Your body wants a very stable blood sugar, let's say 70 to 90, 70 to 100. Right. So it wants a very tight control. So if your sugar goes up, like after a meal, your sugar's going up. Which is body, normal. Your body releases insulin. Insulin then stores that sugar and uh, it can turn your sugar into flat fat once your liver gets filled up. So your short-term gas tank is the liver, long-term is fat. Fat, exactly. Okay, so let's talk about what happens when your blood sugar is low. Okay, so in, when your blood sugar is low, like you are saying, so the, the body doesn't like low or high. So when your blood sugar drops, carbohydrate level gets low in the blood. Remember, your liver's been storing glucose and carbs for this reason. No big deal. After about three or four hours after you eat, you've tucked away all the carbohydrates and the sugars that you've had. Now your blood sugar's back down to below 100, like you're saying 70 to 90, somewhere. But if you wait more than four hours, five hours, six hours, eight hours, your blood sugar's dropping. That's good, that's normal. If you don't put new carbohydrates, new fuel, because you didn't go to the gas tank, you were busy at work, you got you were doing a project, and you're like, oops, I don't have time for lunch. So you didn't go to the gas station, you didn't put new carbohydrate fuel in, your body doesn't freak out after four hours, five hours. It'll say, I'll just use, and I'll break up this, like your liver is a potato, it stores glycogen energy, that's what potatoes do. They store energy for the f- plant. Your liver will break down that stored carbohydrate in the form of glycogen and gradually release it. You're only four grams can only fit into your blood. Your liver can hold 80 grams of, of carbohydrates and glycogen, and you only need four at a time in your blood. So you can see you can last about 15 hours of not eating carbohydrates in a healthy person that's not obese or diabetic, because it takes a lot longer for that person because of the insulin levels. But your liver, after four hours, will start breaking down stored carbohydrate and glycogen and over the next 16 hours or so it'll pretty much go through 70 or 80 percent of that stored and once you run out of liver glycogen because you went more than 16 hours of not eating in a healthy person okay obese and diabetic is very different takes longer um, then your liver will say well that's okay because remember when you ate too much carbs and I was already full of glycogen and you had sugar which has fructose which makes fatty liver I stored that glucose that carbohydrate that sugar I stored it in the form of fat that I can store a lot more energy in my liver, fat. When you stop eating and you run out of liver glycogen after 16 hours or so in a healthy person, you start turning liver fat into glucose. That's a magic trick. That's the magic trick of insulin. Because once you get rid of that, insulin is an energy sensor. And if your liver cells have too much fat and too much glycogen, it says you have too much energy. That raises the insulin levels. They're so high for that to work. It's an energy sensor. You have lots of energy, insulin's high. And now you don't eat carbohydrates long enough. You run out of glycogen stored in your liver. It'll do a magic trick, I call it. And it'll turn liver fat, triglycerides, break it up into three molecules. Glycerol backbone, three fatty acids. Glycerol becomes glucose. So now instead of turning glycogen and releasing it into the bloodstream, you're removing your liver fat and breaking it up so you can release fat into sugar into your bloodstream. And that's why fasting, low carb or whatever works is because it's uh, forcing your body. You're utilizing this thing about your body wanting a sugar at a certain level. It does not want it low, it doesn't want it high. But when it doesn't want it low, when it's been 12, 16 hours without carbohydrates or any kind of food, 
your body will be forced to use up extra liver fat. And when you use up extra liver fat, okay, your insulin drops. I mean, sorry, the first thing is when you stop eating sugar and carbs, your blood sugars drop 80, 70, 60. Your insulin drops. Your adrenaline and your hormones that burn fat go up, you see, and then that activates enzymes that burn liver fat. That's the scenario. Low blood sugar, low insulin, high metabolism, high fat burning, make sugar, buddy. That's how you get better. So I love it. So that's the process in reverse. So when you eat, insulin goes up, that stores the sugar. Then you got this hormone that's the opposite of insulin called glucagon. And then when your sugar drops, like you said, you're doing the project, you forgot to eat three, four, five hours, your blood sugar's yep. dropping, glucagon goes up, and it does the magic trick. I like it. The magic trick of taking fat and turning into sugar. First, it's going to go for liver fat. What about your belly fat and just fat everywhere? Right. So, so look at it this way. So your, your body fat, uh, fat is a fuel. It's an energy source. Okay. It's fuel to make energy. It's fat. But once, it's, once your food energy, whether it came from carbohydrate, sugar, starch, potato, whatever, flour, or it came from fat, once it's in the form of fat in your liver or your body, it's only accessed by that method of dropping your blood sugar, dropping insulin, raising adrenaline, and, 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 and then burning fat. Your liver's job is not to power your muscles. Your liver's job, once again, is monitoring blood sugar levels for your brain, your red blood cells, and what have you. So your liver is the gas tank for your brain and your red blood cells. Your fat suit that you're wearing is the fuel tank for your muscles, which will convert to burning fat in large amounts. If you're a 220-pound person, you're going to burn 2,200 calories of energy a day. Your liver's job is not to help you make energy for your body and your muscles. That's your fat's job that you're wearing, your fat suit, 100 pounds of fat. You see, when you're obese, your liver, it is focused on monitoring your blood sugars. I do not want to drop it below 70, and if it does, I have a mechanism, and I will first use glycogen, then I will use liver fat. So once, you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the liver fat is the next in line behind the carbohydrate to keep the blood glucose at a certain level for the brain, not for the muscles, not for 2,000 calories. Right. <clears throat> so people forget the brain is so important. So important. Your brain runs on sugar. That's right. Your brain runs on sugar. It can, as a backup, run on something called ketones, but that doesn't happen in 12 hours or 16 hours, you see? That's a long-term process. And so, but the process in reverse your liver's job is to keep the sugars level in the blood for your brain, not for your muscles, not for running a marathon, not for jumping around or building a barn. It's for your brain. It's to do brain work. You see, that's not very much energy. A teaspoon of 120 grams of carbs a day for your brain, a teaspoon in your blood. My 100 pounds or 90 pounds that I wore, my fat suit, that powered my muscles. 2,000, 3,000 calories of energy for the day. It wasn't powering my brain. Yeah, so that, that's why it works and that's why it's a thing. But people forget that if you interfere, your body wants to burn carbohydrates first because that's what it's looking for. And once it gets what it needs, the carbohydrate, the sugar in the blood, shut down fat burning. And then let's talk a little bit about, say, because <clears throat> I get people telling me, and I'm sure you do too, oh man, when I don't eat, you know, my blood sugar goes down, I just feel so terrible, I get headaches, yeah, it's bad. I so, felt it, it's true. So, it, so it, let's talk about how to overcome that. Okay, so, so look at this this way. You mentioned something, the like insulin, Okay, that's when you eat, and if you're obese and diabetic, you have high insulin. You're in a fed state. Your body's in storing mode. You have high energy in your body. Remember, mm -hmm. obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, in my view, the way I describe them is it's a state of too much food energy in the form of fat stored in your body, and you have high mm -hmm. insulin levels. Mm -hmm. um, so half, half of our, it, it, think of your pancreas that makes these insulin and glucagon, your body. It's like two muscles. Right? There's a bicep on one side and there's a tricep on the other. Maybe insulin is your bicep. And so when you eat food or eat carbohydrates and sugar, it contracts, you build a big bicep and that does the contraction. And then when you don't eat, then you use your tricep. Okay? It's balance. Everything in your body is balanced. Balance. It's like an up switch and a down switch it, for it, your blood sugar. That's exactly how it works. It's tr because your body is fixated on having a let's say just a 90 blood sugar, it wants it at 90. When you do something like eat carbs or sugar, it makes it 120, boom, the bicep flexes, insulin comes up, pushes it back down, boom, I'm 90, I'm happy. Well, now you didn't eat, you went four hours, you skipped lunch, you got busy, whatever, you woke up in the morning, you didn't have time for breakfast. Well, now your blood sugar is 80, 70, 60, boom, your body's like, I don't like it. Tricep time, insulin low, glucagon high, make glucose. That's the whole thing. There's no like fad about it. That's just how the body works. It half, you know, so it's part of the time you're storing energy, insulin's up, 
Then the other time, you're supposed to rest and use your stored energy. The problem that we had and that I had when I woke up at 6 in the morning for meetings, I'd eat, whether I was hungry or not, and I'd go to bed at midnight. That's 18 hours of eating of high insulin all day for years. I only spent six hours using my tricep and 18 hours using my bicep. You think I'm going to have high insulin? Of course I am, right? That's what I'm asking my body to do. But then the beautiful thing is, once I said, no, I'm going to use my tricep, I'm going to rest my bicep. Well, guess what happened? My bicep got weaker and back down to normal. Insulin lowered, you see? Mm -hmm. And the tricep making energy. So at first, you're going to be miserable. You're going to miss lunch, four hours. You're used to that carb. But as you do, the, you work that muscle out, you go six hours, 12 hours, 12, 12 14 hours. You go, let's say you go 16 hours from breakfast, you know, for, you know, 16 hours from supper one day to the next day breakfast, and you went 16 hours without eating, you're using your bicep, you're using your tricep, the muscle that you haven't used in years. And so, of course, when you go to the gym and you do a muscle you've never, you never used, the first day is terrible. The next time you go back, it's less terrible. The next time you go back, it's even less terrible. And then pretty soon you're like getting pretty good at it. And then pretty soon you're just like, this is normal. I've always been doing this. And it doesn't take that long. Exactly. Well, we need to take another break here. But we're talking to Dr. Ramon Issa about diabetes, weight loss, and uh, your journey in this. And uh, we, uh, we'll be right back. And I really want to talk about some good hints on how to, how to really implement these things very practically. So we'll be talking about that when we come back.